Hello? Oh, hello. Am I speaking with Geoffrey Hinton? You are. This is Adam Smith calling from the website of the Nobel Prize. Okay, I know who you are because I, um, a long time ago, I noticed that they have somebody who calls up to get people's reactions. <laughs> exactly so. Could we talk for just a few minutes? Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, first of all, of course, many congratulations. Thank you. And uh, where are you? Where did, where did the news reach you? I'm in a cheap hotel in California <laughs> um, without an internet connection and with a not very good phone line. Uh, phone connection and I was planning to get an MRI scan today but I guess I'll have to cancel that I had no I, I had no idea I'd even be nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics um, I was extremely surprised it sounds like um, quite a sensible place to receive the news in a way because you're a little bit isolated you can collect your thoughts before before the deluge of the day <laughs> Yes, on the other hand, it's two o'clock in the morning. Oh, goodness. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, oh, dear. Um, I don't know if you got... I think it's three o'clock by now. Yeah, I don't know if you've got the song froid to go back to bed or whether you just have to accept that the day is going to be a long one. Yeah, I don't think I've got that much song froid. <laughs> well, an utter surprise. What, what were your first thoughts? My very first thought was, how could I be sure it wasn't a spoof call? <laughs> and <laughs> how could you it was coming from sweden and the person had a strong swedish accent and there were several of them <laughs> <laughs> yes so it would have to be a posse of impersonators which is unlikely i suppose yes um how would you describe yourself would you say you were a computer scientist or would you say you were a physicist trying to understand biology when you're doing this work i would say i'm someone who doesn't really know what field he's in, but would like to understand how the brain works. And in my attempts to understand how the brain works, I've helped to create a technology that works surprisingly well. It's, 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 it's notable, I suppose, that you've public, you very publicly expressed fears about what the technology can bring. Um, what do you think needs to be done in order to allay the fears that you and others are expressing? So I think it's rather different from climate change. With climate change, everybody knows what needs to be done. We need to stop burning carbon. Mm. It's just a question of the political will to do that and large companies making big profits not being willing to do that. But it's clear what you need to do. Here we're dealing with something where we have much less idea of what's going to happen and what to do about it. And so I wish I had a sort of simple recipe that if you do this, everything's going to be okay but I don't, in particular with respect to the existential threat of these things getting out of control and taking over. I think we're at a kind of bifurcation point in history where in the next few years we need to figure out if there's a way to deal with that threat. So I think it's very important right now for people to be working on the issue of how would we keep control. We need to put a lot of research effort into it I think one thing governments can do is force the big companies to spend a lot more of their resources on safety research. Um, so that, for example, companies like OpenAI can't just put safety research on the back burner. Mm. Is, there, is, is there a parallel with the biotechnology revolution when um, the biotechnologists themselves got together in those Asilomar conferences and sat down and said, you know, there is potential danger here and we need to we need to be on it ourselves. Yes, I think there are similarities with that. And I think what they did was very good. Um, unfortunately, there's many more practical applications of AI than for the um, things like cloning that the biologists were trying to keep under control. And so I think it's going to be a lot harder. But I think the biologists, um, what they did is... Uh, a good model to look at. Mm -hmm. It's impressive that they managed to um, achieve agreement and the scientists did it. So, for instance, with um, the large language models, the thing that, might, that I suppose contributes to that, your fear, is that y you feel that these models are much closer to understanding than a lot of people say. 
when it comes to the impact of the Nobel Prize in this area, do you think it will make a difference? Yes, I think it will make a difference. Hopefully, it'll um, make me more credible when I say these things really do understand what they're saying. Do you worry that, you, that people don't take you seriously? So there is a whole school of linguistics that comes from Chomsky that thinks that it's complete nonsense to say these things understand, that they don't, um, they don't process language at all in the same way as we do. I think that school is wrong. Mm. Um, I think it's clear now that neural nets are much better at processing language than anything ever produced by the Chomsky School of Linguistics. But there's still a lot of debate about that, particularly among linguists. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to come back, though, to the circumstances of you receiving this news in, this, in your hotel room in the middle of the night. In some ways, a rather lonely place to hear the news, no one to turn to to sort of hug and celebrate. Well, I'm here with my, par I'm here with my partner, and she's quite excited. OK. <laughs> yes, indeed. But for now, uh, many, many congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye. 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 You just heard a special episode of Nobel Prize Conversations. If you enjoyed this moment, you won't want to miss a single episode of our podcast. Be sure to subscribe. We're available on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many, many more popular platforms. Thank you.